There's a lot of times people get into a mode of thinking, fasting is works. But fasting is not works. Fasting is stepping away from the natural and saying, I want more of the spiritual. How exciting is that? It's a whole different ball game when you start thinking, God, I just want more of you. And let me give you a secret about fasting, or let me call it feasting on Jesus. Let me give you a secret about feasting on Jesus. It's better to start feasting before you start fasting. If you start filling yourself up with Jesus, then when you start fasting, you already have a source coming into you, and you don't feel so empty, and you don't feel so hungry. So if you can start over here by going, God, you're my everything. You are everything I need. Start there. Start by going, God, your word is actual food to me. I'm going to pray that you guys can receive what I'm going to say because I do have people sometimes tell me that I'm crazy, and I'm okay with it. I'd rather be me and be crazy and to the natural mindset because natural mindedness keeps us away from walking into the fullness of the spirit. And I went through some very extreme glory years where God would just plaster me, but it was in my season of fasting or feasting on him. And um, I, I went through three years of intensity of the power and presence of God being on my life at a very, 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 very deep level. And in that season, I'm going to pray before I tell you, okay? Holy Spirit, I thank you that you supersede our natural minds. You go beyond what we think is possible. You go beyond what we think can normally happen. So we choose to turn over our natural thinking to you. We just say, God, not our way, but your way. We want to walk in the spirit. You said that it's not possible to please you unless we walk in the spirit. And God, we want to walk in the spirit at the deepest level. We want to yield to you. We want your desire to be our desire. We want nothing other than who you are to flow through us. God, we thank you for the privilege of walking through the difficulties of life. God, it's a privilege for us to be counted worthy to suffer in this life to have the fullness that you intend for us to walk into. And so, God, we just say, not my will, but yours be done. Let me walk out the fullness that you intend in Jesus' name. I started telling you the other day that Jill Austin invited me over here. The first time I came over to Heidi Baker's school, it was Jill Austin. It was the most fun. How many of you know who Jill Austin is? She's been in heaven for a a lot of years now, and so probably just a few people, because people come and they go, and, and here we have somebody that is filled with the power and the presence of God. Jill was a radical Holy Spirit carrier. That gal was no joke. She was no joke, and she came. I came over with her, and she had asked me to, and Jill was sharing with me some of her own struggles. And in reality, we all walk through struggles. We are not perfect people yet. However, Jesus says that we can be perfected in this life. That's what he says. And so as we're walking out our journey, Jill desperately wanted to be married. She wanted a husband. And she was in love with Jesus, radically in love with Jesus. She was a Jesus lover. But she was always anxious for the earthly bridegroom as well. And she died at 60 years old, having had a complete love affair with Jesus. And I don't count that as a negative thing at all. If people keep their mind on the natural side, they'll think, oh, why didn't she find a natural husband? But the fact is, Jill had a deep, 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 deep walk with God, and it was amazing. It was amazing to watch her. So she invited me to come over with her. She was the teacher sharing like this. And it was so funny because Heidi was coming, and then a bunch of the students that were from Pemba said, oh, surprise is coming, surprise is coming. Just wait. You won't even believe when surprise comes in. Well, he came in, and it turned the room upside down. I mean, the power and presence of God that he carries because of 
seeking God with all of his heart. That's where we get that power and that presence. It comes from going nothing of this dirt realm, but I just want you. And that's what surprise was like. He's hilarious. And I ended up, I'll tell you my little journey with him, because if we can learn to let go in the natural, it's a very, very hard thing to do. I came over with Jill. Jill said, why don't you come over here, share a paradigm, I think is paradigm, whatever. I can't say her last name properly, but she's still a friend of mine. She's married and has a new last name, but she was Heidi's assistant at the time, and she invited me to stay for a month and stay with them there on the compound in Pemba, and this was like 20 years ago. And so I came over here. I've had several of you say, have you ever been with Heidi's group before? And I'm like, yes, a couple of different times, so I'll tell you about it. So what happened is I come over here, and it was amazing. I was just like, oh, my goodness, this is so awesome. And Jill prophesies over me, and she says, Cheryl, you are going to have to learn to stand under the glory. I'm like, oh, my goodness. Does she have any idea how hard that is? Because I would be the one dropping on the ground like a fish and flopping around and going like, oh. And I'm thinking, I can't. I mean, that would be nice, but I can't. Some people look at other people and think, I wish I could fall on the ground and flop around. I was the one going, I wish I could stand there, but I can't. But what I want to encourage you all to do is let every person have their own experience. Because we're all wired different. We are just wired different, and it's okay. God created us all that way on purpose. We are all individuals, and the power of God hitting me is going to look different than the power of God hitting you, and it's okay. The peace that comes flooding in may just absorb into your very cells and you not move at all. You may end up looking over there and going, I want what's happening to her to happen to me. I may know that she's going through deliverance from a murder spirit. And I'm like, don't do that. Don't do that. Don't be begging for what's going on over there. You be begging for all of God's best for you. And it's going to look different for each of us. And so we can't be judging each other. Like Neville would always say, we're not smart enough to. That's why Jesus said, don't judge. I could, but I asked my father. He gave me permission to judge, but he said to us, don't judge each other. Let each person have their own journey with God. And so I get here with Jill, and Jill's like, you're going to have to learn to stand under the glory. And I'm like, Oh my goodness, you might as well have told me to stand on my head for the rest of my life. I mean, it's just not in my ability to do. But I just said, God, okay, you know what's going on. And it's been a journey, and God has given me an ability to stand, and the power is like jolts coming through, like high voltage power hitting. And it's like, okay, wow. <laughs> and it's okay. But God has us all in different places. We're all on a journey with him. And maybe you haven't felt anything yet, and that's okay. Just say, God, I trust you. I'm on a journey. doesn't matter. I'm not trying to live by my feelings. I want you to saturate my being. And the biggest deal is for you to each one begin to undo the walls that are around your hearts. Because we build walls around us to keep us safe, but what actually happens is the wall that we build around us keeps out all of the good stuff that God's wanting to do. And so the biggest thing at the beginning of this is to begin to say, you know what, God, I break down the walls. Everything, the walls of religion, religion creates huge walls. Religion is rules without relationship. And it creates walls. And those walls think they know and so they don't let anything else in. It's like, I already know that's not possible. My poor husband would look at me and be like, Cheryl, why on earth would God have you on the floor shaking for three hours or six hours? And I'm like, you're going to need to talk to him <laughs> because I have no clue. And my, my husband's very analytical and very smart. And then he started to study the old revivals. And then he started to say, oh, my goodness, this happened in every old-time revival. And I would get up to speak, and my whole body starts shaking, and then I'm laying down on the ground shaking, convulsing. I'm like, I'm the speaker. This is not going to work out very good. Plop me up against the post and hold on to me, and I'll do my best. That's what I had to do. But then God changed my season. And he's like, okay, 
you yielded and now we're moving on and your seasons may look totally different. My husband never, ever, ever gets slain in the spirit. He doesn't have walls up. He's just like, God, do it, do it. And God's like, actually, you're a pillar and you're going to just stand there. And that's okay. It's fine. We can't judge each other. The biggest thing is pull down your own walls. The walls that are keeping the power and the presence of God from saturating your being. And honestly, that takes time. And it takes time of going, you know what, God? I trust you. And I trust these people. And God wants to take us all on that journey of trusting. And so for me, I come over here and, um, with Jill. And Jill was going to leave a week into it. And I was going to stay for the next three weeks. And that night during the service, somebody comes in and tells Heidi, her sister, I think it was, had some kind of a crisis in England or somewhere, I can't remember where, there was some kind of a crisis going on, and she had to leave from then on, and then the same thing happened to Shara, who I was going to stay with, and so the people that I was going to stay with were now gone, and I was in Pimba, not knowing one soul, not anybody, and anybody that knows me well knows that I'm a horrible packer, I can't pack for trips well, I go on lots of trips, I'm a terrible packer, I pack the wrong thing almost every time. It's got to be a spirit, seriously. <laughs> it's ridiculous. I'm like, seriously, it's comical. So I joke about it, and then I had this lady that lives on a sailboat text me from, mm, I think, the Bahamas, and she said, I can help you pack, Cheryl. And I was like, wonderful. And she actually helped me pack for this trip. And I did really good because I used her list. But then I didn't finish checking off all the check marks like she wanted. So I still goofed up a little bit. But I did better because I had somebody kind of organized right here that helped me. But anyway, so I come over here and I have high heels and sparkly shoes. I'm still a little bit that way, but it was ridiculous. And skirts and nothing that fit the culture at all. Nothing. And now I have nobody I know, and my little sparkly high-heeled shoes and my long skirts. It's ridiculous. So I'm sitting at the meeting going, God, you're funny. You've got me in Africa, and I have no clue what I'm doing. I don't know one person. And somebody stands up, and I think it was a surprise. He said, we're going to do an outreach into the bush. And so what we're going to do is we're going to do an outreach into the bush with Joseph. I think he might be in heaven now. But Joseph and Surprise are going to take a team out into the bush for two weeks. And I just thought, you know what? I'm signing up. I have nowhere to be for the next two weeks, so I'm going with them. Who cares? So I just signed up with all of my completely wrong clothes. And the first night out there, we're in a tent, and I have a tent. What do you call them? They're called cellies with my kids, but cellies, I have a celly, right? My tent partner was in there, uh, and we start talking, and guess what happens? I'm shocked. Nobody's guessing. She goes fully demonic, fully demonic, and we're out there with a whole bunch of tents, and we're supposed to be quiet, and she's screaming, and I'm the only one in there, and so we did a couple hours of screaming deliverance in the middle of the night with this bush outreach and I'm thinking I'm going to get kicked out of here this is all bad but in the morning people were like is everything okay back in there and we were both happy and shiny and we're like yeah it was good we had a great night it was perfect what could be better right got rid of all kinds of boogeymen and we're good to go and um, it was hilarious and this little lady comes walking up to me and she said, how long are you here for? And I said, probably three weeks. My plane flies out, whatever the date is. And she said, I'd like you to come home with me. And I said, okay. I mean, I don't know what's happening. I know I'm in Africa, and I know no one. So why not, right? So I just said, okay. And she said, my name is Trafina, and I feel like you're supposed to stay with us. Well, that's Surprise's wife. And so I got to stay at Surprise and Trafina's house for the weeks that I was over there. God set it up. God totally shifted everything around. And he started telling me stories that are incredible stories of coming out of the darkness and out of, you know, I believe his father was a witch doctor. He started telling me, and he, I traveled with him in his Jeep, and he'd point out places and say, that's where this happened, and that's where this happened. And he told me at one point, he said, I had a um, 
vision, like my grandpa. My grandpa used to have full-blown visions where he would see things in the future and then they would play out. My grandpa had a vision of the Statue of Liberty um, crumbling down into the ocean. And she's bowing her knee and, sh and there's a hand coming out of heaven and it puts a sword into the cup that Liberty holds and makes her drink it, and then she bows into the ocean. Well, what do you do with that when you have those kinds of visions? It's like, oh, my goodness, what's going on? Well, the truth is we've really, in the U.S., have already lost our liberty if we really know what's going on. We have to fight to create the mountain. God said there was a mountain coming that would be not movable, and it would be made out of stone. He is the rock, and he is going to build up a kingdom that is absolutely impenetrable. What we are finding out is that every government is shakable, and Grandpa saw that in 1950. He saw it very clearly. Well, now we're living it out 70 years later. But what happened with Surprise is Surprise told me, he said, um, I saw a vision, and I probably have four prophetic friends that have seen this same thing exactly. And it's also in the Bible, so go figure. Uh, but he said, I saw a vision, and he said, Seattle, Tokyo, um, New York City, Hollywood, all of these cities were going through the greatest shaking, and the, the natural world was shaking underneath them at the same time on the same day. A great, great, great shaking that would come to the earth. Well, guess what will happen in the shaking? Revival. People will start to look to people that actually have a hold of what matters and if you're counting on the natural world being what matters to you, you'll be shaken just like the world is shaken. But if you can shift your focus and say, God, you're everything, you're all I need, you're my substance, you're my life, then you won't be shaken. So I have a friend, well, Neville Johnson, he's in heaven, he's my favorite, favorite speaker in the whole wide world. He carried the presence of God, the power, not, not so much power like pray for people, he didn't even do that. He just carried the peace of God at such a level. And he did a series that everyone should listen to. It's called The Keys to the Kingdom. And um, as he's talking about the kingdom and what God is wanting for us, he's talking about us moving into the millennial reign of Christ, that Christ would rule and reign in us, that he would fully rule and reign in us, that we would become what our Father said from the beginning. He wants us to become love. You becoming love is the great goal for your life, for you to look like your father. Jesus said, I look like my father. When you see me, you see my father. Whatever I do, you're going to see. That's what your, my father would have done. So a question about you would be, when we look at you, can we see your father? Can we look at you and say, oh, that's what the father looks like. He's pouring out love. He's pouring out compassion. He's pouring out mercy. He's pouring out grace on the next person beside him, bringing him along. So Neville um, had incredible encounters in and out of heaven, incredible. His life was a journey beyond what most people would even experience or expect to experience, but Neville just was a humble man that loved Jesus. He actually made a really bad mistake in his young ministry and took time to recover from finding out the dirt world is not an answer. And that's a really big deal. How fast can you find out that going after the stuff of the dirt world is not an answer for your life? Neville tells a story about helping, I think it was in Haiti, I'm not sure where, but there was a big earthquake that happened, a big, big problem. And when that happened, they went to help. And there was a church high up in the hills that was cut off from all food, cut off from everything. And that pastor was very, very wise. That pastor, um, it was weeks they were cut off from anything and everything. And it was, I think, more rough terrain, deserty, with nothing and no water. And that pastor said for the church, he said, I want everyone to come for breakfast at 8 o'clock. We're going to feed you. And he got his Bible. He opened it up, and he began to read. And people would get so full of the Word of God 
that they would begin to get up and think, if I eat any more, I'm not going to be able to take it. They would be full, and they would leave, and they would come back for lunch, and they would eat of the Word of God, and then they would do it again at dinner time. They did it for a couple weeks where people were just like, if I'm hungry, I'm going to go to the church. The Word of God is going to fill me. How many of you believe that God is the bread of life? How many of you understand that if you really believe that and you hide it inside of you, then when difficulty comes, nothing can shake you because you actually have bread and you have living water. The living water is bubbling up within you. So God is giving us everything we need to go through, anything that could happen in the world, anything. We should have no fear at all of any kind of destruction. We should be the people that people can look at and say, if things begin to shake, like surprise, said, there's going to be a great shaking. I saw it in a vision. I saw all of the cities shaking at one time and shaking down. He said it was quite serious. But out of that came radical revival. And so rather than look at it like the world would look at it and say, oh my goodness, this might happen or that might happen, we should be the people that learn to eat of him right now. We learn that he is everything we need. If you can start to learn that now, then when things get iffy, you're just like, hey, I got this. No problem. Let me help you. Let me help explain to you who my God is. He's the substance that is everything we need. And it's really true that he is. We just don't understand that. We don't practice that. And so I'm going to take you a little bit on my fasting journey, or should I say feasting on Jesus' journey. So I mentioned the other day um, that for me, I was selling real estate. I didn't tell you how I started selling real estate. I started selling real estate because I had four prophets come and say, you need to sell real estate. And the fourth time someone said it, I thought, I think I better pay attention um, because this it does, wasn't anything I wanted to do. It was something that prophets started telling me, you're supposed to be doing this. You're supposed to be doing this. And I'm like, oh, my goodness. So the fourth time, I order a package. How many of you have ever gotten your real estate license? One. There you go. Uh, yeah, I still have a real estate license. I was, yeah, a few, a couple. Okay, so... I was not excited about getting my real estate license, and if anyone hasn't figured it out, if you know the temperaments, I'm a sanguine. Sanguines like to have fun, they like people, and they like to play, and they are not very detail-oriented, and they aren't trying to administrate everything. That's me. So, um, God tells me, get my real estate license, I order a packet so that I can study to get my license. And when it comes, it's this big old box with so much stuff in it. And I'm like, God, you know that I don't want to study all this stuff. It seems like nonsense to me. But you said that I was supposed to get my license. So I'm doing this for you. So I'm studying this. I must study this as if I was studying something that mattered. Because to me, it didn't matter, except I wanted to obey, right? And so I open the box, I look at it, and I'm like, I'm never going to pull this off. I know me. I can't do it. I opened the first pages and I looked at it and I thought, who cares about these words? They're words I'll never heard of. I'll never use them in my life. I was horrified. And I was just like, this is terrible. But I knew God wanted me to do it. And so as I'm looking at the box, it says, once you go through all 13 manuals, all 13, uh, they were VHS back in the day. Once you go through all of this, then you take a test. And if you can pass that test, then the state board exam will let you take a state test. And so you know what I did the day it came? I pulled out the test. I thought, perfect. (laughs) I pulled out that test day one. I put it in the computer. And guess what? God passed. God passed. I couldn't have passed. I didn't know any of it. Nothing. But God passed the test for me because he wanted me selling real estate. That's reality. He wanted me to sell real estate, and he knew me, and he thought, you know what? We're going to just pass this test today because I know my girl, and she is not going to study all this like it would take to get there. Well, my dad was a builder, so I understood building, and I know people, and I know integrity. So it was easy to sell real estate. It was easy to do the right thing, and I just got a business partner that knew all the details, and I passed the state board exam day one. It was easy and hilarious, and everybody was looking at me like, is she a genius? And I'm like, "Uh, nope, not even slightly. 
God passed the test for me because he wanted me in there. And that was my journey. It's not everybody's journey. Some people have to fight through all kinds of stuff. For me, God put me into real estate. And I did four years of real estate. And it was the best thing for me. And I look back at it now and think, God, you're hilarious. I had my three boys within three years. So I have three very close boys that were all graduating high school and going away to college at the same time. I also took in a bunch of other people. I think you've figured that out already. But I had several more boys that were that same age at the house at the time. And so within a year, my house went from five high school, college age guys to nobody in the house. And God knew that for me to be busy doing something that was a lot of work would be the best thing in the world to transition from having lots and lots going on in my home to everybody gone from my home. So I look back and I think, God, you are so kind and you set me up for success. Not only did he set me up for success in that manner, but he took me into a, an out of the church arena where I could share the love of Jesus and I had to be bold. I wasn't delivered yet. I still carried my own old baloney with me, but I was in an arena that I was doing really, really well, and I never had to use a microphone because there was only one person or two people or three people, so it was perfect because I was good with a few people, and I did really well, and so I ended up with awards, and just I did well, and I would tell, like our elders, I would say, ooh, don't buy that house because I think the market is going to go down. I think it's going to bite you in the rear. Don't do it because people were making a lot of money buying and flipping houses. And several of them decided to do it anyway because they thought it was wrong. And it proved out that they looked back and said, I wish I would have listened to you, Cheryl, because I didn't just try to sell real estate to make money for me. I really tried to do what was best for the other people. So God saw that as that was my journey. It was just a piece that he wanted for me. And really, it was a test because there were times that I was with someone and I knew if I talk them into buying this house, I'll make $7,000. But I don't think it's the best value for them. So what do I do? Do I talk them out of that? Or do I go ahead, they want it anyway. I'll just go with them. Or do I go, you know what, honestly, let me help you with what this neighborhood looks like. And this is, you know, all that. So it's an integrity check all the way around. I think our lives are all that way at some level as we walk through life. God is going, hey, I'm going to put you in spots and see what you'll do. See if you'll represent me rightly. Because if you graduate from there, I'll put you here. And then I'll put you here. So anyway, I was on a journey. And then when God spoke to me, I was it, selling real estate was so easy. And God spoke to me, he said, Cheryl, I need you to start fasting and praying. I need you to stop selling real estate. So I called my husband, told him God just told me to stop selling real estate. And he said, are you going to fast and pray all the time? And I said, I don't know. But I do know that he said, I need you to stop selling real estate. I need you to start fasting and praying. So what doesn't matter is what that looks like. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if there is no money. It doesn't matter. None of it matters. It matters that I obey God when nothing makes any sense. And so I had eight houses in escrow, and I called Becky, and I said, Becky, I'm going to give you all these houses. I'm going to let you finish them out. God's talking to me right now, and he's telling me he just needs me to fast and pray. And everybody pretty much thought I was crazy. They're just like, what is she thinking? What well, was the best thing that could have happened? And without me knowing it, it was a season my husband was going through where he was very, very tempted to uh, resign. And pastoring is a lot of work. If anybody has ever pastored, we've pastored. We have a 40-acre property, and we've pastored lots and lots and lots of people for lots of years. And basically what that means is to lay down your life for other people. It means, you know what, be willing to do what they need done, not what you want to do. It's a lot of work. My husband was tired. I didn't realize it. My husband was about ready to take a break. And so when God took me out of real estate and caused me to start fasting and praying, I was praying my head off. I prayed day and night. And he, like, took me over. Little did I know, how many of you think you know something of the power of prayer? Been heard about it, experienced it a little bit. The power of prayer is huge. It's the currency of heaven. And here we have it right here in our hand, and yet we don't use it. If you had millions of dollars in your hand, would you use it? 
prayer is like that. And God is saying, would you pray? Would you spend your time going above? What if God said that it wasn't possible for you to please him unless you walk in the spirit? He did. What does it mean to walk in the spirit? How many of you know what it means to walk in the flesh? How many of you have ever, ever experienced walking in the flesh? It doesn't work out so well, right? That's, it's ugly. It gets ugly in the long run. It's, I, it's me, I, I want this, I want that, right? And God says, it's not possible to please me unless you learn to walk in the Spirit. Well, that means you've got to give up the stuff of the flesh and say, I want the stuff of the Spirit. And so that's what God did with me, and it was a sovereign journey, and I thank God it's not going to be anybody else's journey. It was my journey. And we can't look at each other and go, I wish that was my journey. We each have a unique journey. So let's let each other be unique. You don't try to copy me and I won't try to copy you, and you don't ask to be me, and I won't ask to be you. We all are a piece of the puzzle, and it's important. It's important to play your part. And so for me, God took me into intensive fasting. As soon as I stopped selling real estate, he, uh, well, first I have to tell you that I was a non-faster. How many of you are kind of non-fasters? Like, I'm good, I don't need to fast, that's not... Not really what I'm trying to do. I was a non-faster. Our church fasted three days every month, and it was a prophet that told us we should. He said, you need to tithe your time in fasting. And so every month, give three days. And so we'd do that, and we would get to the three-day fast. And I would tell my husband, is it okay if I go visit my mom or (laughs) I go to Arizona for this next week? He's like, okay, sure, whatever. So I really, really always tried to find a way out of it. It wasn't what I wanted to do. And that was my own flesh and my own wants, right? And it wasn't that I didn't love God. I just didn't see the need. I didn't see the the results or what it would do for me. But um, so I stopped selling real estate, and God spoke to me immediately and said, okay, I want you to do a 40-day juice fast. And I'm like, I've never fasted three full days. How am I going to fast 40 days? But it was easy. God took me by the hand, and he just said, you, we got this. And he started making me so hungry for his word. I would sit and read, sit and pray, read um, books on revival. I probably read every book on revival there was. Hilarious. Read and read and read, and I just was consumed with hunger for him. Just consumed. The more I fasted, the more I would be hungry for him. The more I would want more of him, more of him. And so... I did the first 40-day juice fast, and I was just beyond delighted and excited and so hungry for him. And then I did a month off, and then he said, okay, let's do another one. I'm like, oh, my goodness, you are on a wild one. But he took me over and took me on his journey of, of feasting on him. And at the very beginning of it, he said, here's the deal, Cheryl. He said, you've never wanted people to look at you like you were highly spiritual or that you had the mic in your hand, all that stuff. I was still not even delivered of my struggles. And he said, you've never wanted people to look at you. You've never wanted people to notice you. He said, the Pharisees in the Bible would want people to look at them and see how sad they were and how they're struggling and they're fasting. And he said, I told them not to tell anyone. But what I'm telling you is to tell everyone. He said, I need my bride to fast. I need my people to learn to feast on me. I need them to come up higher and eat from a realm that's above the natural realm. You know, one thing I learned way later in life, I learned that from a naturopath, um, OBGYN doctor friend of mine, she said, Cheryl, an apple uh, 50 years ago, she said one apple 50 years ago had so much nutrition in it that today you would have to eat 21 apples to get the same nutrition that one apple will give you 50 years ago. Everything has been depleted on purpose. And so if you think natural food is what's going to get you through the future, you just are confused. We have to learn to eat of the Spirit. We are being systematically mm, marginalized by what they're doing in the natural to the food. And what you need to do is go above. You need to eat of the Spirit and go, you know what, I'm not worried about what the world is doing to the food because I have a source that's greater. And so what Jesus said when um, 
it was the woman at the well. And Jesus is coming up, and the disciples look at him and say, aren't you hungry? And he said, oh, I have food to eat that you don't know about. Well, what my husband would say is he didn't have Twinkies in the desk, right? That's not what he was talking about. He had union with God that brought deep, deep, deep satisfaction and deep um, nutrition. It's really our source of life. If we are spirit, our spirits are enlivened through union with the spirit. And our flesh should be what flows along behind. So we are body, soul, and spirit. How many of you really live spirit, soul, and then body? Your spirit says, body, this is what you're going to do today. And your body says, I mean, your spirit says to your soul, soul or personality, this is what you're going to do today. And then your personality says to your body, body, you're not going to eat today. You'll eat tomorrow or you'll eat in two weeks. And your body just says, okay, no problem. It depends whether your spirit is the strongest part of what's going on. So as your spirit gets to be the strongest part of what's going on, your spirit can say to your soul, so, hey, knock it off. You come with me. And then your soul says to your body, hey, sit down and shut up. I'm in charge, and we're going to do what I want to do. God wants us to get so strong in the spirit that our spirit can take charge of our soul. We're not. Have you ever seen somebody that you're like, okay, that person is out of control? I'm not talking about in the Holy Spirit either. I'm talking about out of control naturally. Their soul is out of control. They're on a wild one, right? It's because their spirit doesn't have the strength to bring that soul into check and the body is following whatever the soul says. Am I making sense? Do you guys know what I'm talking about? So God is saying, I want you to be spiritually strong. I want each one of you to be very spiritually strong. And as you get spiritually strong, it's from encountering him. Let me say this. Reading the Bible is fabulous. It's very important. It's very wonderful, very necessary. Hearing the voice of God is ten times more important. The Bible was written from a whole bunch of people that actually heard the voice of God. We have all their stories. Why aren't you writing a story? Why don't you have a story? Because you're encountering him constantly. And in that encounter, you are writing the last chapters of the book of Acts because you're hearing God. You're walking with him. Angels are coming. That's what God said we could do. Jesus encountered in the desert the devil and he had help from heaven in, in the Garden of Gethsemane. We had a prophet come to our church one day, and he said, oh, my goodness, there's these two huge angels, and they're the angels that were in the Garden of Gethsemane. And if you think that's cheery, you're not me. <laughs> I was like, oh, shoot, this is not a good thing. If we've got the Garden of Gethsemane angels here, there's something going on that's a big deal, and we need to be really, really on our knees, right? We can't just act like, oh, no big deal. We're all on a journey to complete the story that he wrote. His story, you're completing it, and we each have a piece of that. It's a really, really big deal. And if you decide you're not going to complete your piece, somebody else can, but really, it's for you. God's like, here, I want to give this to you. It's your portion. Come here. And I used to laugh about it, and I would say, God, why on earth would you punish Esau so terribly for eating a bowl of porridge? Didn't that seem like that's like kind of rough punishment for wanting a bowl of stew? You lose your birthright? And then when God started taking me on this journey of feasting in him, I began to understand he's wanting people that are going after the things of the spirit and don't just rely on dirt world to be their substance. And I'm not saying fasting is the answer. I'm saying it is an answer. The Bible actually says my disciples will fast and pray. There is a lot, um, there's quite a, dogma going around today that says, oh, fasting is just works. Well, it isn't just works. It's actually laying down the fleshly side and going, can I learn to eat of the Spirit? Can I come after more of the Spirit and be more in line and in tune with you? And so the journey, my journey was quite, quite, quite unique. 
Can I sit here? Do you guys care if I put a chair right here and sit here? I want to do this. I'm going to have to read a little bit, but I want to just sit here and tell you the story. So my journey was this, and I actually made myself weak, fasting longer than I had the spiritual energy to handle when I first came here. I really wanted to fast the whole time, but I hadn't taped up in the spirit enough to be able to do that. That's just the truth from my perspective, my story. Um, anyway, so I got myself a teeny bit weak. But um, my spiritual journey was this. When God took me out of uh, real estate and took me into fasting, he, I didn't understand feasting on him at that point. But he took me and he said, Cheryl, I want you to read all about study all of the people that fasted the very, very most throughout history. Well, I had no idea. I just didn't know. But what I found out as I started studying was that fasters are world changers. That's just the truth. And then what I found out, that was the Christians. And I started studying. I'm like, oh, my goodness. The people that spent time fasting and praying were people that changed the world. And then he said, now I want you to study the people that fast the most that aren't Christians. And I was so shocked. It was horrible. I was so in shock because there were gurus that would go two years without food, believing in their demon to sustain them. And I really got offended, and I thought, this is just not right. We have people with all kinds of Mm, false gods and idols that are believing more in those gods and those idols to sustain them, then I can find Christians that will go, I'm going to lay down what I want and I'm going to do what you want. So what I found was that there was a lot more in other wrong religions of people that were more serious about believing that they could be sustained by another source. And it, it broke my heart. I just really thought, God, this is just not right. It's not right that your people who you said should fast are not the people that are fasting. It's the people that are believing in demons, and they're ending up with supernatural power because they're going after the spirit, and they're getting negative spiritual energizing, and the church is not learning to take of that part that really is important. And so for me, God just took me on that journey and I read and read and read, and I was just like, God, I'm so sorry. I will do it. I'm just going to sign up, right? I'll just do it. I want to be what you want. If you want me to do without food, I'll do without food. You tell me how long, you tell me what to do. Well, he took me on many, several 40-day juice fasts, which were easy, to be honest. It's right here is the biggest problem, nothing else. The biggest, what people say is they say, oh, I get hungry. I'm like, okay. You're right, you got hungry. And when you get hungry, eat of him. When you start to feel a hunger pain, you go, I'm going to eat of him. He is everything I need. He said he was bread of life. He said he was living water, and so I'm going to eat of him. So I did that, and then, um, uh, honestly, it was pretty wild. I went on 40-day fast, and I would be fasting on a cruise. We'd go on a family cruise, and they're all feasting on the cruise, and they're like, mom's crazy. She doesn't even care. But I'm like, I don't care. I want to do what God wants me to do, no matter what it looks like to the natural, right? And so I did that. And then um, my husband, I, I started getting slain in the spirit, like a lot, because I would be going after the things of the spirit, and God would take me out in the spirit. And he was changing me. And what he was doing, my husband would say, Cheryl, what is going on? When you're out cold for six hours, what is going on? And I'd say, honey, I don't even know. All I could say is I think God is changing my heart. I think he's healing me. I think he's changing me from what I want to what he wants. And I, don't, I need to not care. I need to be okay with whatever that looks like. And so um, my husband was struggling at the time. We had a church, probably a 1,000 people, and he was trying to sort out how could it possibly be a good value to have to backpack my wife out of the top of a four-story four building. You know, this seems a little odd, and he'd have to throw me over his shoulder and hike down the stairs with me because my body would be limp. And he didn't understand, and he would say, God, this doesn't make sense. I don't understand. 
and I didn't understand, but we both had to just be okay with each other's journey. And we ha- I did not blame him that he wasn't in my journey. He had to not blame me that my journey didn't make any sense, right? We had to learn to be okay with the journeys that we were on. And then God spoke to me one day, and he said, Cheryl, would you do a three-day water fast for me? And I had never done a water fast. I didn't like water. I was like... No, I live in California. We can fresh squeeze orange juice. It's delicious. I'll do 65 days on orange juice any day. It's like, come on, let's do it. It's fun. That's not a big deal. But what is a big deal is when God says, how about you do water? And I'm like, oh, no, I don't want to do water. But I would do anything. What I actually told him is that, you know what, I would do anything for you. There's nothing I wouldn't do for you. And he said, okay, well, then I want you to do a three-day water fast. Well, I had asked my husband... Um, I told my husband, how would you, he asked me for my birthday, what would you like? And I said, I would like you to go to a conference with me that's a little wild for you, but it's something that I think will be good for both of us. And he said, okay, I'll do whatever you want for your birthday. So he went to a Paul Keith Davis, um, Bob Jones, and a bunch of different prophets in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. And so we were there together, and it was my three days on water, and my husband was going to go home the fourth day, the end of the third day, and do a wedding. And I was going to stay one more day. And that day, I was like, God, that day, anything you want to do, you can do. But up to that day, please don't be crazy because my husband's not liking all this crazy stuff. He's thinking I'm a little bit too much. And so I'm like, God, I just want to be the best wife in the world. I don't want my husband to have to put up with any crazy stuff. So please, 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 just be gracious with me. I'm, I'm going after you, but... I'm going to water fast, but just don't let any crazy stuff happen. And uh, that was my deep cry. And I wanted to be a good wife. I'm like, I'm not trying to drive my husband crazy. So, which was interesting challenge. So anyway, um, we get there. I do three days on water. And it's time for my husband to fly back home. And it was wonderful. And my husband's like, I loved it. It was wonderful. Paul Keith Davis is still a very close friend of ours. And it was where my husband met Paul Keith. And Paul Keith has encounters where Paul Keith was there watching Stephen be stoned. And then God said to Stephen in the middle of being stoned, this one, he said to the guys stoning him, he said to Paul, this one is going to cost you. And it's really interesting. He's watched those things out of history, and he's got stories surrounding him. And so for my husband, he was very, it was surprising and wonderful, and he loved him. And so um, my husband was getting ready to go, and I pushed through the double doors. And as I pushed through the double doors, I hear my own voice say something that I didn't try to say. How many of you have ever had that happen where you said something that you weren't trying to say, and it was your spirit speaking straight out of you? And my son had it happen one time. My son went in a line at a youth camp, and he turned around and looked at the girl behind him, and he said, you should sleep. And he thought, what is wrong with me? He's like, why did I just say that? And he said, as I looked at her, I said, you should sleep. She burst into tears. She's sobbing. She said, how did you know I have insomnia and blah, blah, blah. And then she was healed completely. And he said, yeah, the next day she came back, and she said, I slept all night. I can't believe it. But God spoke out of him and said, you should sleep. So that's pretty fun. Well, for me, it wasn't quite so fun. Actually, I pushed through the double doors. And as I pushed through the double doors, I hear my own voice say, I need that too. And I look to the right, and there's this table. And it's all full of every revival book. And I'm looking, thinking, is there any book I haven't read? I think, I think I've read all of them because I was so on fire for Jesus. I It's all I would stay up late into the night reading and then up and early in the morning reading and praying and just excited. The fire of God. There's nothing better than a deep intercession where you're hearing the heart of God and the fire of God is in you. It's the most exciting life. And I hear myself say that. So I look there and I'm like, I don't think it could possibly be that. So I look to the left and there's a lady from Israel and she has a little tiny booth and a bunch of jewelry. And I thought I already met her. I wasn't really wanting her to pray for me. You know, I just thought, I don't know what I said that for. And so she says, right then, you're going to need to kneel down then. So then I'm kneeling down. It happens without me trying to do it. I'm kneeling down at this Israel lady's booth and she pulls out a jar of water puts it in her hand, she starts pouring it in her hand, and she puts it on the other lady's head. Remember, I said, I need that too. And what it was was Jordan water 
and she poured it in her hand and put it on this other lady's head. And when she did it, she said, I baptize you in the Jordan River. Well, I'm thinking my natural mind is racing. I don't believe in sprinkling. I don't think I need rebaptized. What the heck is going on, right? I'm like, oh, no. But God spoke up out of me and said it. And so she grabs my hand. She puts it on the other lady's head, and she says, um, do you feel that? Do you feel the fire of God on her? It almost makes me get slain in the spirit. And I pulled my hand back. I'm like, oh, no, <laughs> this is what I was trying to not do. Remember, I have a husband roaming around here. Anyway, so she pours it on my head. <laughs> she pours it on my head. I baptize you in the Jordan River. I still have some issues. I don't, I really don't want, like, I put hairspray in my hair. I don't want water poured on top of my head when I have a week of hairspray in my hair. It's not my favorite idea. So she pours it on my head. She says, I baptize you in the Jordan River, and I'm out cold on the ground, out cold. Typically, when I'm slain in the Spirit, I'll be slain in the Spirit, but I can, my eyes can work, and I can actually talk. And I'll be like, I'm sorry, you guys, I can't move. I, I'll try. I'll try to move my little finger. I'm like, I just can't. Give me a couple hours. Just go do whatever. Leave me here. Lock the building. I don't care. It'll be fine. But this time, I'm out cold, and I can't talk. And out the corners of my mouth, I'm drooling. <laughs> and I, my eyeballs still work. It's the only thing that works. My eyeballs are working. I'm looking around. I'm thinking, God, remember we had a, we had a deal. You weren't going to do anything crazy. And my husband was going to be happy about this. So my husband comes walking up to me, looks at the lady, looks at me, looks at the other lady. And he says, who prayed for my wife? And she says, oh, I baptized her in the Jordan River. And I'm thinking, oh, my word. My husband is going to think I've lost my mind. And I'm laying there like, God, you hate me. What's going on? This is terrible. Dave looked down at me, and he said, Cheryl, you know I need you to take me to the airport. I can't even talk. My whole prayer to God was, God, I just want to be a good wife. I want to respond properly. I don't want him to think I'm crazy, right? Remember, that was my prayer. God thought he would be funny. He thought he would supersede and do whatever he wanted to do. So I'm laid out on the ground, drool coming out of both sides of my mouth, me laying there like, are you kidding me? That's not what I wanted to be doing, to be honest with you. It's really not. But I did want all of God. So I was pressing in and saying, God, I want what you want, but please don't make my husband unhappy. And so here I am, and he's looking at me, and he's saying, Cheryl, I need you to take me to the airport. And I'm thinking can move my eyes. That's about it. I can't respond. I can't say anything. And he said, Cheryl, I'll give you 30 minutes. And in 30 minutes, I need you to get up. Well, I have experience in this arena. I have six hours at a time where I can't move anything. This time I can't move my mouth. And I'm like, God, are you kidding me? My husband, <laughs> you know, what about him? And he said, I'm going to just go look at books and stuff, and I'll be back. So he went, looked at books, and he came back in 30 minutes, and he said, okay, Cheryl, I need you to get up. Well, I can't move. I'm like, you think I'm in charge? He thinks I'm in charge? No. My husband is very much in charge. I am not. Well, in this situation, God was way in charge, and neither of us were. And he looked at me. He said, Cheryl, I need you to get up and take me to the airport. And I try to move my finger, and I'm like, yeah, that's not going to happen. I can't move. And I say to him, I try to move my mouth, and I'm like, oh, at least I can talk. I'm like, honey, I'm really sorry. I didn't try to have this happen. He said, sure, please don't try to explain anything. I don't want to hear any, any, anything about it. I just need you to get up. And I'm like, please, can I tell you that I didn't try to do this? And he's like, whatever happened, happened. You're there. I need you. And he's really a wonderful person. He's just very much different than me. We're very opposite. And it's okay, right? God loves him right where he is. God loves me. He's not trying to not have God touch him. He's trying to have God touch him. God touches me different than he touches him. That's just reality of our lives. And it has to be okay. And he just said, Cheryl, I really need you to get up. And he said, well, will you pray with me that God will let you get up? And I said, honey, I didn't try to have this happen. I think God's up to something. I think I'm on some kind of an operating table. I think he's trying to take all the ugly out of my heart. Heaven knows what he's doing. I don't know. But I know it's, a, it's him. Can we just pray that if he's done with what he's doing, that he'll let me get up and take you? And if he's not done, that I can get the other lady to take you. And he said, that's fine. 
And so I prayed, and of course, I couldn't move. And I asked the other lady, because remember, there was another lady involved. And I looked over at her, and I said, honey, any chance? I'm still laid out on the ground, right? And I'm like, any chance you could take my husband to the airport? He kind of needs a ride. I can't move my hands. He kind of needs a ride to the airport. She's like, oh, I'd love to. So she takes him to the airport. On the way to the airport, she starts asking him questions. And my husband is a pretty wonderful person. He's not like me in the way that he gets spiritually touched like I do, but he's very wise. He has a lot of wisdom, and he's got a lot of gifting, and he's just an amazing guy. So she takes him to the airport, drops him off, comes back, and um, I don't see her. I'm still slain in spirit and out cold in front of the double doors where you're trying to get in the meeting at nighttime. And so the ushers come, and they are like, can you get up? And I'm like, nope. And they said, can we pick you up? I'm like, of course, feel free. I mean, I've been hauled around by all kinds of people at this point. You talk about humbling. It's embarrassing. It's like get to the point where you're like, I am going to have to go to the bathroom in a couple of minutes. This is not okay. I really need to be able to move, right? It's like, God, seriously. But God has, I mean, my brother has hauled me home, put me to bed. I'm just like in my clothes. He's like, I'm like, Steve, leave me like I am. Put the covers over me. I'll come to tomorrow, right? But for me, that was my journey as I was fasting and seeking God. Years down the road, I meet this lady at a conference, and she comes up to me, and she said, do you remember me? And I said, I'm not sure. And she said, were you at Coeur d'Alene? And I said, I was. She said, we got baptized in the Jordan River together. And I'm like, oh, my goodness. She said, your husband changed my life. She said, I asked him some questions, and the direction he gave me on the way to the airport changed the course. She was a doctor. said, it changed the course of my life. And I look back at that, and I think, who would have thought that God would need to knock me clear out With some lady, I mean, none of it made any sense, but God's bigger than we understand. And if we can get out of the way and let him do whatever he wants to do in whatever situation, he's up to things. He just is. And for me, uh, my husband's gone, and so then I no longer was trying to be good. I mean, by trying to be good, I mean trying to not get slain in the spirit, trying to not have any crazy things happen for my husband. And so the next day, the power of God rocked me. And Paul Keith Davis called me up and he said, I need you to come up here. Um, He said, I need you on platform. They prayed for me. I got slain in the spirit so bad. I'm out on the ground. And do you know what it's like when you feel a piece of spaghetti noodle? That's what all of my limbs were like. And so they needed me to get up for the next part of the sermon. And I'm laying there like, oh, no, <laughs> what are you doing? I'm like, you might need to help me. So they pick me up and plop me on a chair, but I'm like spaghetti noodles. And my legs are dangling and my arms are dangling. And I'm like, God, what are you doing? Talk about, it's, it's humbling, honestly. It's kind of embarrassing. I used to have a spirit of embarrassment. Where How many of you have ever been like, if somebody, if you think something's going to be embarrassing, you'll start turning red already? I was that person. I would turn bright red if I thought something might be about to happen. And then God took me through this whole process during the middle of me fasting and praying a lot. And that day, the the day my Jordan River water day, I actually did get baptized in the Jordan River later for real, the real full meal deal where you get dunked. But for me, that day, God spoke to me and he said, would you do 40 days on water? Or no, he said that was three of 40. That's what he said. And I would have never endeavored to do a 40-day water fast, never. But he took me three days in and just began to go deeper and deeper and deeper. And so then I went ahead and I did 40 days. And during that next year, I probably did maybe three 40-day water fasts. And honestly, It was learning to eat of him, learning that there's a substance that's more important, more valuable than any other substance. And he told me, I want you to share this with everybody because my bride needs to fast. He's wanting us to prepare ourselves, sanctify ourselves, purify ourselves. And did he do that? Does he cover us with his love? Absolutely. But what he's wanting is us to be completely... Um, what do you call it? Overcomers, complete overcomers. So you can look at your individual life and go, am I an overcomer in every area? 
We each can do that. And so we can use the religious redemptive thing of God's covered me, and he has, or we can take it a step deeper and say, God, purify my heart at the deepest level. Take everything out of me that doesn't please you. I love you. I thank you that you covered me in your love, and I am sanctified by your grace. However, I want to take it into the next level. I want everything in me to only be what will please you, only be what will represent you on earth. So Jesus says, I'm coming back for a pure and a spotless bride. And it says, she has made herself ready. Doesn't say he made her ready. It says she has made herself ready. And so the bride has to be a people that are so in love with Jesus, that are so going after him and going, God, I don't want the stuff of this world. It's the dirt world stuff that will totally distract you, totally take you out, and totally make the stuff of the Spirit not land the way God wants it to. God wants you to carry the power of his presence. He wants you to carry everything of him and not to carry the stuff of the dirt world. So I call it the dirt world because it's the taste, touch, see, feel world. So if you're thinking about your own life and you're thinking, okay, what is going to make me the happiest? What happens in your mind? Does that come from the taste, touch, see, feel world? Or is that something that comes from the spiritual realm? And God is wanting us to graduate into the place that what we desire is of the spirit, not of the flesh. The flesh stuff doesn't matter anymore. It's like, I don't care. None of that stuff moves me. It's not exciting to me. doesn't matter. There's a place of walking in the spirit that is so exciting, and God's going, come here, come here, come on. And sometimes we have to take baby steps into that. And it's just one baby step at a time. It's like, okay, I'll not eat one meal. So you can't start a marathon. Like, how many of you are runners? I'm very proud of you. I'm not able. I'm not. I, God has never challenged me to run. I would love it if I was a great runner. I'm not a great runner. David Hogan, you go to David Hogan's, he's like, okay, hit the barn. We're going to go out there and do pull-ups up, chin-ups up the rope, right? I mean, I don't know how many of you have been there. It's David is intense. He's intense. And it's, there is no excuse. <laughs> this is just what you're going to do. And he's a disciple. He's a disciplined man. And he's disciplined in the, the spiritual um, fasting. David used to, I don't know if he still does, but he used to fast every other day. And he probably, probably still does. He, we've been with him. We travel with him some. And so, Sometimes he does the sundown thing. It's it sun's down and we can eat dinner now and whatever. But the truth is he's a disciplined one. And for me, the journey towards discipleship, towards going, I want you more than I want what I would have wanted, has been a dying to self at a very deep level. It's been, okay, even if my husband isn't as happy with me, I want to go after you and maybe something crazy might happen in my body that I didn't expect and we'll work through it as a couple. We'll work through it later. Rather than my old self would have thought, I don't want my husband to be unhappy at all. And God took me into a deep level of yield to me. I'll sort this out with your hubby. Yield to me. And for Dave, Dave always says, Cheryl, you actually are the, the one that is the greatest example of running after God that I could imagine because that has been the desire of my heart. Well, so I start in, and God takes me into these long fasts, and he tells me, teaches me about um, the people that are going after false gods that are actually going, say, two years without any food. And then he's talking to me about it. He's like, Cheryl, come on this journey. Come on this journey. And so he took me in a three-year period on probably more fasting or feasting on him than actually eating. And so I got to a point with my husband one day where I told him, I said, honey, you know, honestly, I don't know that I need natural food. And my husband's like, oh, my word, Cheryl, you have always been kind of crazy. And I'm like, honey, read John chapter 4, 5, and 6. It says clearly that I have bread of 
life. I have living water. It's in me. It's in me, and I know it. And I had fasted, feasted so much that I really wasn't very interested. I didn't care much about the dirt world food. I didn't. And God had challenged me, and he would say, come on, let's do a 40-day fast. And 13 days into it, he would say, you're done. And I'd be like, what do you mean I'm done? He's like, you did what I needed you to do. Now you can keep fasting, or you can be done, do, you know, but he needed me. He used me as a tool in a spiritual warfare to be the fasting piece to get things done spiritually. So anyway, it was three years, lots and lots and lots of feasting on him, and it was a wonderful season, and I had, he had really worked me through the Bible, and you can all read it, John chapter 4, chapter 5, and chapter 6. He goes through over and over again things in John chapter 4, chapter 5, and then chapter 6. He says, if you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you will live and never taste of death. So that's walking like Enoch walked. It's learning to eat of the spirit and understand that spiritual substance is what you live by. But it's outside of what we yet understand. But God is wanting to teach us that. And Enoch learned it all the way back in the Old Testament. God is wanting to take a a group of people and say, hey, I'm everything you need. I really am. I am the source of life. You're eating dead stuff that you think is going to bring you life, but I am life itself. Eat of me. So anyway, I was telling my husband, I'm like, God is teaching me in John chapter 4, chapter 5. I'm showing him, and he's like, Cheryl, it does look like it says that. But he said, I've never heard anybody talk like that. And I'm like, well, he's talking to me. And so it was just a beautiful, exciting time of learning the value of feasting on him and delighting in him. And honestly, it was the most spiritually charged three years of my life by far. And I ate very little natural substance. It wasn't what I ate of. I ate of the spirit. And so here I am at the end of um, the three-year period and... I didn't know it was the end of a period. I didn't know what was going on, but I just was going after him and delighted and excited and eating his word constantly. And I'm going to a conference, and I'm going with 17 ladies, and I told my husband when I left, I said, honey, I'm not sure I'm going to eat after this. And he said, Cheryl, I don't doubt that. It doesn't shock me one bit, and I'm 100% fine with it. And people that I knew really well would be like, They'd never sat down with me when I was eating because I mostly was fasting or feasting on him. And there's been seasons of life where I could eat of him at such deep levels. I had no interest in anything else. And so that was a season. And I told my husband, I honestly think God's just wanting me to walk this out and show people that he is life itself, that we are caught up in a natural world that we don't have to be in. He said, Cheryl, nothing that God does through you will shock me at all. You go for it. Totally fine. I am fine with it. I'm not slightly worried. And he really expected me to do that. And so what ended up happening is I went to the conference and I got up and shared a little bit. And when I sat down, the Holy Spirit spoke to me and he said, you can eat now if you want to. And I was like, I thought we were on this journey. I'm not trying to go on a crazy journey by myself. I thought we were on this journey together. And he said, again, you can eat now if you want to. And so I thought, I'm not going to do something crazy by myself. If the Holy Spirit leads me, I will go with him. But I'm not going to do this without him leading me. And so I went out with the girls and had an In-N-Out burger. And my stomach, don't do, don't do what I do. I've done 40-day water fasts and eaten a crispy chicken salad and gotten on a plane to India. But I have an iron gut. You might not. Don't do what I do. Don't do it. Don't, you do what God tells you to do. I, I don't have problems like that. I, up to this point, I haven't. So let's just say you do what God tells you to do. I'll do what God tells me to do. But I went out, ate the In-N-Out burger with the girls And the Holy Spirit speaks to me in the middle of me finishing my fries and my In-N-Out burger and probably a shake. And he says, now I want you to ask me for a sign if what I'm teaching you is really me teaching you. Well, I'm thinking, of course, what you're teaching me is me teaching, you're teaching me. Of course, I already know it. I mean, God had taken me on three years of 
feasting on him and not even caring about dirt world food. I mean, was, but it was a learning to hear his voice, quieting myself, hear his voice, do only what he wants me to do, say only what he wants me to say. Literally seven days that he said, don't say a word. I'll tell you that story in a little bit if I have time, but I don't want to get sidetracked on other stories. Um, and even my don't shop, I don't want you to buy one thing for 40 days, different, different journeys. It's like, be still. Stay in your room for 40 days. Like, that's a challenge. Like, okay. My husband's like, you are making life so challenging for me. <laughs> I'm like, I'm not trying to. I'm trying to hear God. But anyway, I'm down there. God speaks to me, and he says, now ask for this sign. This is the sign I want you to ask for. Ask for someone to get up and share exactly what I've been teaching you. And I'm like, oh, it's not going to happen. There's no way somebody's going to get up and teach what I've been hearing because I've never heard anybody teach it in my entire life. So God said, put out a fleece, and if I'm really teaching you that I'm everything you need, if you can eat of spiritual substance and live and never taste of death, if what I'm teaching you is really true, then have someone else teach it tomorrow. And I was disheartened. I was like, I don't think anybody's as crazy as me. <laughs> I'm like, I've never heard anybody talk like this. So I watered it down, and I said, God, if somebody gets up and talks about fasting, I'll know that you're teaching me that you're everything I need, that I don't need natural food, because I knew he was teaching me that. Anyway, so I watered it down to what I thought that I could imagine someone doing. I get to the class tomorrow. And Patricia says, Patricia King, she says, everybody, don't judge my friend. He's very unique. Uh, I'm going to have him come up and share his journey. But he's very, very unique. Please don't judge him. I've been to his place. He's a man of God. He's wonderful. And don't judge him. And he's very unique. So he gets up there, and he said, before I talk, I want to show something. He pulls up a big screen, and he shows himself running a half a marathon. And he said, that's a 13-mile run or whatever it was, 13 miles, and I'm three months into a juice fast when I'm doing that. And I'm like, oh, my goodness, what is going on? And he jumped in, and he said, okay, open your Bibles to John chapter 4. We're going to read what God actually says about food. And I'm like, oh, my word. And he taught exactly what God had been teaching me point by point by point through John chapter 4, John chapter 5, John chapter 6, said, if you will learn to eat of me, you will live and never taste of death. And I'm sitting there with the widest eyes you could imagine, because it was a three-year journey God took me on, but he was taking me on a journey of letting go of the dirt world, letting go and saying, come up here. Will you come up here? There's more for you in the spirit than there ever will be in the natural, but you are living by the natural most of your life. And God's like, come up higher, come up higher. So anyway, when he got done teaching, which was exactly what the Holy Spirit told me after I ate the burger yesterday, and I went ahead and I went up and talked to him. His name is Kirby, and I said, Kirby, I cannot even believe this. This is what God told me, and now you're teaching exactly out of John chapter 4, 5, and 6 what God told me for the last three years. He's been teaching me that he is really everything we need, that we don't understand, that we've been programmed, that we need the substance of the dirt world, when in reality, we need the Spirit. The Spirit gives life. The Spirit gives life. Remember that. It's the Spirit that gives life. We think dirt world food gives life. That's what we've been programmed to believe. But it's the spirit that gives life. And it's pretty exciting. Anyway, as God began to teach me all of this, and I went and told Kirby, and Kirby's like, oh, my word, your grandpa is on my wall in my prayer room. And so we became good friends. I know him very well. I go home. David Hogan is at our house, and he's home at our church for a conference. And uh, we got to lunch, and David said, so what's going on, Cheryl? You know, what are you doing? And we're good friends. He's like my brother. And I said, well, you aren't even going to believe what he's teaching me. And he said, what? And I told him, and he said, what? He said, what? And he's a fasting machine. And he said, what? And I said, he's teaching me that he is everything we need, that we think we need other substance, but that he is what we need. But it's us learning to eat of the spiritual substance that is the problem. That's the problem. And so David would look to me, and he said, and I told him where it was, and he said, Okay, I'm going to go and read this. The next day he comes back to lunch and he said, it says that. It does say that. 
He said, why haven't we seen this before? And I said, I don't know, but I know God's teaching it to me, and I know it's a deeper teaching than I've understood. And he said, it absolutely says that, Cheryl. Well, so he comes back the next day. We're still having meetings at our church, and he comes back, and he looks across the lunch table, and he said, Cheryl, you do this thing, and don't you do it halfway either. And I'm like, oh, my goodness. Now I have the Holy Spirit breathing down one side of my neck and David Hogan breathing down the other side. That's a little intimidating. I'm like, seriously, it was bad enough when it was just Jesus. But <coughs> David is our very, very good friend, and he's a radical. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so that night I go to church. And the Holy Spirit speaks to me, and we're in this prayer time. Holy Spirit speaks to me and says, ask that man over there what he thinks about what I'm teaching you. And I'm like, God, I'm looking crazy. You have me looking crazy. And he's like, no, go ask that little old man what he thinks about what I'm teaching you. And so I went over to him, and I said, hey, my name is Cheryl. He said, I know who you are. And I said, well, I just need to ask you something. God asked me to ask you what you think about me being able to eat of him and drink of him and not need natural substance. Because I know we're all natural-minded at one level, and we're all thinking this is ridiculous. We need natural food and water. That's what we are programmed to believe. So I asked him, I said, what do you think about God teaching me that I don't need natural food, don't need natural water, I need him, and he's my life substance? He said, oh, this is a piece of cake. I said, actually, a piece of cake is my problem right now. I want Carl's Jr. chocolate cake with cream cheese on top. Ever since I got back from my uh, In-N-Out burger, I would be craving this piece of chocolate cake with cream cheese on it, seriously. And I would get three of them, put them in the fridge, and I'd be like, I, if I want it, I've been fasting for three years, okay? If I want to have cream cheese cake, it's okay. So I have this cake as my thing. And he said, oh, this is a piece of cake. And I said, a piece of cake is totally my problem. He said, no, no, a piece of cake means this is easy. And I said, I know what you're talking about, but tell me what you mean. He said, I have gone 57 days, no food, no water, no problem. And I'm like, God, are you kidding me? But God was just teaching me that we do not need the dirt world substance like we think we do. Our soul wants it. Our mind thinks it's the important part. He is everything we need. The Bible says it over and over. It says Jesus is everything you need. He's everything you need. The question is, is he everything you desire? And the answer is not at all. The answer is, no, I desire all kinds of dirt world substance. But as we let go of that and go, God, I want you to be my everything. I want you to be everything I desire. I want to feed off of you and to be, have life coming in and that to be my source and my substance. That is the journey that God wants us on. So anyway, I left that. Uh, my husband and I were headed to teach in Hawaii at the YWAM base for um, a couple of weeks. Went up there from that time and I jumped into a no food, no water fast and did a dry fast for eight days, and it was easy. It actually was easy, but I was in a space where he was everything that I was taking in, and it was exciting. I got stung by a bee that my leg swelled up because I have been allergic to bees. I let my natural mind take over, and I thought I better flush out the poison, and actually when I called Kirby, he said, no, you did the right thing. You should be drinking, and everybody always says you should drink. What I'm saying is there should be a living water bubbling up within every one of us, but that only comes as we learn to feast on him, and we can learn to feast on him. Do we need to look emaciated as we fast? Not at all. We should be able to eat of him, feast on him, and I have had uh, fasting seasons where I stayed the same size. I've had fasting seasons where I lost all kinds of weight and went really, really skinny. So I've had different things happen in life. But what I'm wanting to teach you is that God wants to be your substance. He wants to be your life source. He wants to be everything you desire. And what you've got to do is think in your mind, what do I have to trade out in my thinking to begin to desire only him? What is the thought process that needs to be changed out? Is there something like for me, when God told me, Cheryl, I need you 
to do a seven day, <clears throat> no, um, not one word, don't say one word. And this is a funny little story. He said, Cheryl, seven days, not one word. And I thought, okay, so I told my husband, my husband has had to go through the gamut with me. I mean, I'm a unique individual, life goes on. It's all good, and God's teaching us both through it. But I said, honey, God wants me to do a seven day, not one word, say not one word. And we had a bunch of people living at the house with us. And um, he said, Cheryl, I think you should go to Reno to our timeshare. I think you should go up there and do it up there. And I said, I think I could do it here. I don't think I need to spend the money. And he said, it doesn't matter to me, but if I were you, if I was doing it, I would want to be all by myself to do that. And I said, I think I could do it here. It's no big deal. Holy Spirit speaks to me right that minute and said, oh, so you wouldn't mind going to Reno with your husband for a week, but you don't want to go with me. I said, oh, honey, I think I'll go to Reno. I think, I think I'll go to Reno and take you up on that deal. I think I'll stay there. So I went with the Holy Spirit for a week, did not one word out loud, took a little flip card thing. So I wasn't even fasting at the time. I was fasting talking. So I was eating, and I would go to a place, and I would write down, I need two tacos, give it to them, give them the money. And I told the girl as I walked in, there was a girl at the front desk, and I told her, I said, okay, I'm a really friendly person, but I'm going to be not saying one word. I'm going to be here a whole week. I'm not going to say a word. If I need a towel or anything, I'll write a note. And I thought, I felt like I was so weird, right? I was embarrassed at the awkwardness of it all. But I was trying to obey God. And so I went up, and it was the most, it was a wonderful, wonderful season of just delighting and refreshing and being filled with him and just incredible week. And as I left, I wasn't quite done with my seven days, and so the girl at the front desk, same girl was there, and I wrote her a note and said, thank you for being so kind, you know, see you next time, something like that. So we come back in two years, and it was a wonderful, refreshing season, but nothing real miraculous. It was just wonderful. Uh, we come back in two years with the elders group, and I walk in, and there's the lady that I had seen that had seen me doing the silent fast. And I felt weird doing it in front of her because she was in there every day, and she saw me come and go and never say anything. I mean, I'm a friendly person, so I never walk past people without saying hi. It's just not my nature. And so it was kind of awkward for me. And so we come walking in with the elders, and it's a timeshare, and she was sitting there, and the Holy Spirit said, she's ready to receive me. And I was like, oh, interesting. So we were going to pray, and so our whole group went up, and we prayed until one or two or whatever. We prayed with the group of prayer people. We're all praying. And then I went down, and she was still there, and I went down, and I said, she actually was reading um, Left Behind. And I said, honey, I want to talk to you. And she said, are you the lady that never talked for a week two years ago? And I said, I am. Are you Crystal? And she said, I am. And I said, um, God told me he wanted me to come down and talk to you. He said, I said, I don't believe it's like it says in this book, but I know he's coming for his bride. I know God's coming at a very deep level. And she started asking me questions, and we talked, and I led her to Jesus, and she gave her whole heart to the Lord. And I said, All right, what's your living situation? And she's crying and praying, and she's just totally receiving everything. And she said, I always wanted to talk to you. You came that week and you never talked. And I always wanted to talk to you. And here God set it up. He put that hunger in her. Why would I be doing that? Why would I be doing what I was doing? And she knew I was a Christian at the time. She could tell probably from my reading material, whatever, um, or just from my life. But I looked at her and I said, so what's your situation at home. And she said, well, I have three boys and I have a husband. I mean, I have a, a boyfriend I live with. And I said, well, to really serve God with all your heart, you need to marry him because God wants you to not live with somebody that you're not married to and you would need to marry him. And she said, oh, I don't, I always thought that if you got married, it would ruin a relationship. It's just always been in my mind that you could live with someone and it'd be fine, but if you marry him, it ruins it. And I said, no, 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 that's just the enemy trying to keep you from a stable relationship. God wants you to be willing to marry and have a real family. And she said, I'm going to call him right now and ask him to marry me. So at 3 o'clock in the morning, she calls Adrian. She calls Adrian. She said, I, this lady has just led me to Jesus. I'm asking you if you would be willing to marry me, and I want to serve God with all my heart. And he says I should marry you, and 
he, I could hear him on the other side of the phone. He said, I wanted to marry you for seven years. Are you kidding me? And she said, okay, let's get married. So my husband and I, the next day, my husband met her and uh, when she came back on shift, and he said, hey, we'll do a wedding for you. Why don't we meet you and your husband at Tahoe? We'll do a wedding for you. And uh, we planned it two weeks out, and we did a wedding for this couple. They ended up working in a church. It was really an amazing, amazing story, and it was coming from obedience of hearing God and doing what he wanted. But we went to do the wedding in Tahoe, and um, we met at a certain place, and we looked down over the beach, and there's this beautiful gazebo all set up with flowers all over it, and there's no people anywhere, and it's a wedding gazebo, and it's all beautifully set up, and my husband is like, hey, quick, let's use that right there. We ran down there, did their wedding in this fabulous gazebo, probably thousands of dollars worth of flowers. There was no people anywhere, did a little wedding, got all these beautiful pictures for them, and gave them to them, had them printed out, whatever, did a little book for them. And God set it all up. God did all of it. The people come walking back up there like, hey, this is our, for our wedding. We're like, yeah, we just used it prior to yours. They laughed, and they said, oh, that's funny. And it worked out perfectly. But God set it up, and it wasn't anything I could have set up. It wasn't anything I could have done. And he did the same thing with me in many different seasons. He would say, okay, I don't want you to buy anything for 40 days. I don't want you to um, leave your house, leave your room. I want whatever. I would just went on a journey of trying to hear his voice and not just do what everybody else does because it's what everybody else does. Do your journey with God. Let God speak to you. Let him take you deeper. Let him take you into really being his disciple because what he's wanting for you is whatever he says to you, not, he doesn't want my journey for you. He wants your journey for you. And it'll look different than mine. And it's okay. And for my husband, my husband is an amazing, amazing leader. And he has to be really, really, really strong. And God saw that he needed the super sensitive, super soft side in me. He needed me to be the opposite of him so that we would fit together and actually make a whole unit. And so people laugh about it all the time. They're like, you two are as opposite as could be. And it's true, but it's the will of God so that he would be able to play out what he wanted to. So anyway, I wanted to challenge you all in feasting on Jesus. And you can do that before you start fasting. You can do that as you take his word and just begin to go, God, you are everything I need. And <coughs> there are many stories throughout life where things happen and the natural circumstances are that there isn't food and God shows up and is the substance for the people. And so the world's got all kinds of thing, things shaking, and I laugh at it all. I think, you know what? We are created to be the ones that can laugh at the calamity as things begin to happen and say, our God is everything you need. There's nothing in him that's missing. He is complete. He is the source of life. He is substance. He will give you everything you need, and he will do it outside of the natural boundaries of life. Does that make sense? Does anybody have any questions? I'm happy to take questions or do anything like that. Um, the natural mind will be the biggest thing that will get you in trouble. Be careful with the natural mind. Be careful with your own pride and your own flesh. If you try to go in your own pride and your own flesh, you will hit a wall. You will crash. Don't do that. Hear what God says to you, and God may say to you, that he wants you to fast one day a week. And that is one thing I did want to share before we finish, is just that as you learn to feast on him, it's just like, I'm not a runner. I could learn to run. I could learn to go, if I start exercising my muscles, I could go out and start walking this much, walking that much, and get better and better, and then I could get to jogging. The same is true of fasting. You have to start small, like miss a meal, then miss two meals. Say, okay, Monday, Wednesday, I'm going to miss a meal. Monday and Wednesday, I'm going to miss two meals. Or maybe I'm going to only eat a six-hour period of every day. Our bodies actually are healthier if we do that. And science is starting to sort it all out. And God said all along that really, I would say, God didn't say this, I would say as American people and really most of the world, we're eating ourselves to death. We're actually filling ourselves with stuff that isn't life substance, 
and it's taking us out. We need to be careful that we hear God's voice and do what he wants us to do, not just what our soul is wanting us to do. But anyway, as you're beginning a journey of feasting on him, fasting, you start by eating and eating, filling yourself up with him. And then when you start doing away with the food, you don't notice it so much. This last season uh, of fasting or feasting on him, I will absolutely readily admit I have been running a million miles an hour and not quieting myself like I used to quiet myself and got myself weaker, weaker, weaker as I feasted, fasted, fasted and didn't have enough of the substance of life. But so I just want to share, I always share openly my journey because the fact of the matter is he is everything and you will feel that he will be your substance as you begin to eat of him. Does that make sense? Yeah, question. Well, eating, <clears throat> eating the word of God, taking his word, and just really taking it. Like what I do when I read the Bible is this. I read the Bible and I say, okay, I'm not reading it because I already know it. I'm reading it for the things I don't know. It's like, what is in here? And then I, the Holy Spirit will highlight a, a word and say, study the original origin of that word. What does that word actually mean? Shocking what you're going to find out. My husband was studying, you know, the verse, I can't think what verse it is, but it's the verse about the sky being rolled up like a scroll, and it scares people really bad. Well, the original Greek or Hebrew, whatever it is, of that, the words there, the original words actually mean everything will be made brand new. Totally different than what it says. But if you start reading, you start eating of the word, it's the word of God, and you take that in. So that's how, I, what I'm talking about, learning to eat of him and go, you know what, if I'm running at breakneck speed, and then I'm like, okay, I'm going to fast, then I am going to wear out my physical body. But if I really make him my source and my substance and my delight and I'm spending my time in his presence and then I start doing away with the natural food, it, it's different. It's, you can shift gears and kick into the substance of heaven. And God said, I'm, he said, it's not possible to please me if you don't walk in the spirit. Well, how many of you spend most of your time thinking, I'm going to walk in the spirit? Most of us don't spend our time thinking like that. We've got to learn to think, God, teach me to walk in the Spirit. The flesh is not supposed to be our motivating substance, and the flesh has been our motivating substance in the food area, primarily most of us, most of our lives. And God's just wanting us to shift to where we actually have an ability to get a hold of Him being our substance and really us being able to eat from another realm. And then it's pretty exciting, pretty wonderful. And to be honest, as I did that through those three years, the power of God would come so strongly through me that it would throw people down. And it, it got crazy, crazy, the power of God, to where it actually, I backed away from it because people were looking at me and looking to me, and I didn't like that, and I didn't want the pride to, to grow in me, and so I pulled back, and it was just a hard thing for my own self, and I had to work through all of that. We all have to work through the stuff of life, but don't be afraid to eat of him, and so for me, I'm headed into a new season of going, okay, um, the last season has been very, very, very full and difficult with a lot of hard things. One of my prison boys I took into my home, um, I told you guys, I think, actually literally killed one of the girls that I led to Jesus. She, he shot her head off. And so I've been through a lot of very harsh things and things that will take you out of flowing in the spirit if you're not careful. God is wanting us to move past the dirt world taking us out. So I've gotten lots of chances to learn. I can't let that take me out. I need to go deeper into him. Anyway, what I want to do is pray for all of you that want God to teach you to feast on him, to take you into a deeper relationship of eating of him 
And don't let it be a religious thing. Religion is nonsense. It will never be an answer. This is not about religion. This is about a relationship of feasting on him. Okay? So let's use the last 20 minutes. And uh, anybody that wants that prayer, come up here. We're going to pray for you. And hopefully the whole team can pray for people. But let's just jump in and ask God to fill us with hunger for him more than this dirt world. So God, we yield our lives to you right now afresh. I yield my life to you afresh. I say, God, I surrender all. I want you to be everything I desire, God. And we lay down our lives right now. <clears throat> and we say, God, teach us to feast on you. Teach us to be hungry for the things of the Spirit, God. We lean into you and we yield to you right now. And Holy Spirit, I ask you to come. Angels, come and touch each person that is sitting here. God, I ask you for the divine nature of the living God to begin to fill each person that is here, yielding themselves to you. Let your kingdom be the deepest desire of our heart. God, we're asking you deep, deeper and deeper and deeper right now. Holy Spirit, I just ask you to touch people as they yield. Just begin to do business with God and just say, God, I give you my right to this. I give you, I know some of the guys in our church that have gone through seasons of intensity have said, you know, I don't want to lose muscle mass or whatever. And then they've gotten to the point. I have a, a young disciple that is just a radical zealot at this point. And that boy could care less anymore. And he used to be on, you know, like magazine status. He's like, I don't care. There's such a better place. This natural world, we got to let go of all of the desires that are in the natural world. So God, we just say we surrender everything. We surrender all. Our heart's desire is that we would be filled with you alone, God. God, you are the substance. You're the source of life. Let life Go deep, deep, deep. God, we surrender our right to three meals a day. We break the power of the lie that that is what will give us good life. We break the power of that lie. We break the power of the lie that the natural realm is the answer to a spiritual longing. We break the power of every lie that has been held us holding us in any captivity and God I just say let us surrender at the deepest level God I ask you to give hunger for the things of the spirit give us hunger for the things of your spirit let us long for you at the deepest level let our hearts be hungry for you God we surrender our rights we surrender our rights to just have a natural life and do the natural things. And we say, God, we want to be led by your spirit. Holy Spirit, we just say, you are everything that we need. You are the source of life. You are substance of life. You are the greatest desire of our heart, God. And God, where we are caught in the dirt world, where we're caught up in the substance of this dirt world. God, we ask you right now to begin to strip away the hunger for the things of the flesh. God, strip away all of the lusts of the flesh. Strip away all of the passion of the dirt world and God cause us to be a people. Cause us to be an army that is raising up with fire in our eyes where we see the prize and we want one thing and one thing alone and it is that we would be like you that we would be just like you jesus jesus that your people would shine with the brightness of your glory in this dirt world that it would be on earth as it is in heaven god we know that in heaven we won't die without food and we break the lie that we have to always live by the bondage of this dirt world. We break that lie by the authority of heaven. We break it off. We say that you said that it would be on earth as it is in heaven. And we agree with that. And we say, God, let it be inside my life the way it will be in heaven. Let me surrender at the very deepest level, God. I want to just challenge you as you're praying. I want to challenge you that when Jesus said that you're to pray that it would be on earth just like it is in heaven, inside you 
begin to look at what it will be like in heaven. Will you still have the same desires? Begin to eradicate those. Begin to say, God, I don't want those desires to be in me. Those things that won't make it into heaven. I want to eradicate those out of my life. We all know that in heaven there is no death. We don't die in heaven. And Jesus said that his desire would be that it would be on earth just like it is in heaven. And so, Jesus, we thank you that you broke the power of sin and death and hell and the grave. You broke those things off. And, God, we ask you to take us deeper into the things of the Spirit, deeper into the passion to walk in your Spirit, God. God, bypass our natural brain bypass our reason bypass our logic god move the tree of knowledge of good and evil out of our way and let us eat of you you are the tree of life let us eat of life itself and jesus we thank you that you are the substance of life you are what we need to eat of and god we ask you to teach us to walk in the spirit teach us to walk by your spirit and let all of the stuff and all of the substance of the dirt world grow strangely dim let your kingdom be established on earth as it is in heaven in each of our lives just begin to repent go in and you let god bring up the things that he wants to bring up. They're going to be different for every single one of us. All of us have different thought processes. So God, we just say we surrender. We want to be disciples. We want to not just be good kids, but we want to run with you. We want to delight in you. We want to carry the authority that you originally intended in the garden. It's your will that we would be people beings of great light and glory on earth like we will be in heaven that our lives would be a praise to your name while we walk here in the dirt world god let your kingdom be established in each of our lives let us hunger for you god i pray for a supernatural impartation of hunger for the things of the spirit let your kingdom begin to display inside of each of our lives. Let there be a display of your kingdom. God, go deeper and deeper and deeper. We're just going to pray for a little bit here while he leads us.